Uh, thank you very much for the organizers of this splendid meeting for inviting me uh, for a plenary lecture here. Uh, it's a great honor. I feel humbled and I'm, I'm very excited to tell you a little bit about the work we're doing at Yesipa. Um, and I hope at the end of this talk uh, you will see that insect science actually can contribute to poverty alleviation. Before I start with the little stories I have for you, uh, let me give you a very, very short rundown on what ISIPA is all about. We, we strive to be a center of excellence in, in insect science. Um, we do research and capacity building. I always stress the capacity building part of ISIPA. We've trained since our inception, approximately 500 African entomologists uh, at PhD and MSc level. And very often our contribution to capacity building in Africa is, is highlighted when it comes to reviews. We're an intergovernmental organization. Uh, we have a charter that has been signed to date by 14 uh, sovereign nations. And this the fact that we are an intergovernmental organization gives us diplomatic privileges in most of the countries in Africa we're working in, and I can assure you that makes work in a practical sense much easier. We are unique in the sense that ISIPA was created in Africa, um, and we've been around for quite some time as an, as an independent organization. Last year we celebrated our 40th 40th anniversary, so we have been around for quite some time. A couple of facts and figures, we are between 400, sometimes 450 uh, staff members, projects come, projects go, uh, approximately 50 scientists, 96% of all colleagues that are working at ICPE are Africans, so evidently I'm one of the few exceptions. And I come back to the capacity building part. We always host about 50 to 70 masters and PhD students, most of them from Africa, in residence at ISIPA. We enjoy support, core support, from a number of European governments, as well as from our host country in Kenya. And in terms of operational support, um, we enjoy and we are lucky to, to have support both from more development-oriented donor organizations as well as from scientific funders. We were found in Africa and we are clearly focusing our work throughout the history. We have focused our work throughout our, our history on Africa. Presently, ISIPA is active in about 24 African countries with a slight bias towards Sub-Saharan Africa. We have some activities in the Maghreb, but clearly the focus is more on Sub-Saharan Africa. We do some limited collaborative work outside Africa. That's usually linked to uh, classical biological control. We're engaged in explorations in the aboriginal home of alien invasive pests in Africa and some of the most important crop pests in Africa are actually of invasive origin. But that's about it. That's about the work we do outside Africa. Our headquarters is, as already mentioned, in Nairobi. We operate a second campus uh, at Mbita Point on the shores of Lake Victoria. That's where we do most of our malaria work. Some of you might know Nairobi in terms of altitude, 1800 meters is malaria free, whereas the Lake Victoria region is hollow endemic for malaria. We have a couple of other field stations across Kenya. We have a field station in Port Sudan where we do uh, most of our desert locust work and we have a, uh, a, an, a country office in Ethiopia. The way we work is best encapsulated in what we call the 4H paradigm, H for health. So we work on four areas of health. We work on human, animal, plant, and environmental health. And since the vast majority of the colleagues at ICIPA, like in this audience, are entomologists, the common denominator of these four H's are insects and other arthropods. 
So what I would like to do in the following is just tell you three stories. Three stories that hopefully will encapsulate a little bit what we are doing at ISIPA and hopefully will convince you that insect science actually can significantly contribute to poverty alleviation. Let me start with the first story. This is Pushpul. Pushpul is one of our flagship programs, flagship technologies, and Pushpul is quite unique in the sense that it addresses the three most important constraints for cereal production in sub-Saharan Africa that are pests, and particularly pests in the field, and this is in the case of cereals, Lepidoptera and stem borers, the parasitic weed striga, and last but not least, and actually most important, soil fertility. Just a quick reminder, Africa harvests the oldest soils on this planet, meaning they are also the soils that are most depleted of nutrients. So very often African soils are very poor in nutrients, and which is one of the main factors for the very, very low average yields of cereal crops and other important staple crops in Africa. So Pushpo addresses these three, three aspects in, uh, together. Stem borers and striga. One word to striga. Striga is a parasitic weed that attacks cereals. And if you want, the mean thing about striga is Striga thrives particularly well on poor soils. If you have better soils, or if you can afford to improve the nutrient content of your soil, be it through mineral fertilizer or organic fertilizer, Striga is of a lesser problem. You don't have these means. You're really hit hard by Striga. Meaning, Striga is really a scourge for the poorest of the poor in Africa. Very often small-scale farmers, very often women farmers. So what is Pushpul? Pushpul is, a, is an intercropping system that encompasses three crops. A cereal, here in this case it's maize, can be any other cereal. It can be sorghum, it can be millet, it can be upland rice. And two perennial fodder plants. One, as you see in the border around the crop, this is napier grass, Penisetum popoleo, an indigenous, very important fodder grass in Africa. And the second is a legume that you see here in the middle. This is Desmodium. Desmodium, again, a perennial legume, high value fodder plant. Now, how does it work? If you take the example of maize, let's go one step back and come back to the alien invasives. Maize is an alien invasive in Africa, if you want. Maize was introduced in Africa, to Africa, by the Portuguese some four, 450 years ago to West Africa from the Neotropics. Maize production in Eastern Africa is much more recent. If you take the example of Kenya, maize production is approximately 100 years old. Now, the vast majority of the stem borer species that attack cereals in Africa are indigenous to the continent. Hence, no coevolution with maize. This also implies that the, the, the capacity of the moths to find this host plant is very limited. Whereas the moths, the stem borers, have co-evolved with the native grass, in this case here, napier grass, Penisetum purpureum. So, volatiles emitted from napier grass are strongly attractive for the female to lay their eggs on. Now, if you recall evolution being a, an arms race, the napier grass has de developed over these millions of years of co-evolution, very efficient defense mechanisms to reduce the impact of the stem borer on its, on its figure, on its plant performance. Hence, in terms of the biotic performance of the stem borers on napier grass, it's infinitely lower than on this highly susceptible maize plant. So, 
you have the pull effect that the Napier grass is attracting the moths to lay eggs on the border, away from the maize plant. In the middle, you have the second intercrop, Desmodium. Desmodium as a dicotyledone is a non-host for stem borers. Now, in addition to being a non-host, as a matter of fact, the, the, the moths do not like the smell, the volatiles emitted by Desmodium. Hence, they are pushed away, pushed away again towards the border. So you have this dual effect of the two companion plants eventually resulting in a significant decrease of stem borer infestation in such fields. Now where does the Striga come into place? Striga homontica does not affect legumes and legumes possess uh, certain chemicals in their rhizosphere or release chemicals in their rhizosphere that trigger germination of Striga seeds. And I should mention that one of the, 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 the terrible things about Striga is the ability of a Striga plant to, to produce seeds. Uh, on average, it's about 20,000 seeds. And these seeds remain dormant in the soil. So legumes, in general, produce chemicals or release chemicals into the rhizosphere that trigger germination of Striga seeds. However, what makes Desmodium special is a second set of chemicals that not only that after triggering the germination basically have a herbicidal effect on the emerging Striga seedling. So if you want, Desmodium is causing like a double whammy on the Striga plant. It triggers germination and a second set of chemicals kills the plant. Now this has dramatic effects, especially on the seed bank. What you see here is a, a six-year-old, six-year-long trial where we compared uh, maize monocropped and maize in a push-pull, in, in an intercropping with this module on heavy striker infested seed. And what you see is the seed bank, the, the number of striker seeds in the soil. And as you can clearly see, if you plant maize alone, you, you end up with some sort of a linear increase in striker seeds in the soil. Whereas if you plant it together with this module, basically you clean up the soil from this module. Now, one word of caution, you can achieve in terms of cleaning up the soil, the same effect if you plant six years in a row beets. However, you might clean up the soil, but the farmer wouldn't harvest a gram of cereals. So push-pull enables you to continue cereal production on heavily striga infested soil and at the same time clean up the soil of these weeds. This curve shows you the adoption rate of push-pull in the Greater Lake Victoria region, uh, which includes Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. I sometimes call this the Facebook curve of Isipa. You know, it's a very slow uptake of the technology in the first five, six, seven years after we started to roll it out. And then it started to become exponential. We are presently having about 56,000 farmers in this area practicing push pull. And we are optimistic that by 2020, about a million farmers in Eastern Africa will have adopted this technology. The 56,000 farmers I'm pointing out here are all GPS recorded. So we clearly know where these farmers are. And a last point is we have zero dropout rate. The ones that, that adopt push-pull stay with the technology. To wrap this up as, as the benefits of push-pull, it greatly reduces the losses to striker, uh, to stem borers, and it, it heavily controls striker in the field. Because this modium is a legume and fixes nitrogen, makes nitrogen available to the, the, the accompanying cereal plant, we have a threefold yield increase through improved soil nutrients. Desmodium is a perennial, so you have constant soil coverage, which leads to a better water utilization. 
Naked grass, as I said before, is among the most popular photographs in Africa. This module is a high value protein rich fodder as well. So growing a cereal in, in a push-pull system provides farmers with additional income through production of fodder. And what we've seen over and over again is when farmers start to utilize push-pull and start to enjoy the increased cereal yields in the second and third year of production, the first thing they do with this, well, first of all, they enter the cash economy. Suddenly they are able, these small-scale farmers are able to sell surplus grain and enjoy monetary benefits. The first money is usually invested into education. Once the educational bills have been paid for the children, the next investment is usually in livestock. So if you want, we see a perfect correlation with a little time lag of milk production and push-pull adoption. Because push-pull farmers will start to buy a goat or a cow and start to produce milk. And by this, improving their economic situation as well as their health. The intellectual fundament of push-pull is a thorough understanding of tritrophic interactions. And since a couple of years, we, we got particularly excited, excited and interested in the role of infochemicals um, that plants release and communicate with their natural enemies. This work started in a way with this photograph. This is Brachiaria grisonta. It's another indigenous photograph to Africa, very important indigenous photograph in Africa. And since about three years, we've started to develop or to adapt the push-pull technology to more drier environments. Climate change is, is rapidly having an impact on agriculture in Eastern and Southern Africa. It becomes drier. And so we are trying to adapt the push-pull technology more to arid and semi-arid regions of Africa. And this, this necessitates looking for companion plants that are more drought-resilient, uh, more drought-resilient grasses, more drought-resilient legumes. Now, Brachavia brisanta is one of these more drought-resilient um, fodder grasses. What we observed in, in our studies is that when Kylopatellus, one of the most important stem borers, oviposit on Brasharia, we see a massive reduction in the production, the release of one of the most important uh, herbivore-induced plant volatiles, this hexanal acetate, Z3HA, as you can see here. Now, this, re re this reduction in Z3HA uh, emission from these uh, plants where the, the moth has oviposite on has two very stark consequences. First of all, the plants with the eggs become significantly less attractive for other moths to oviposite. But, at least what I think even more interesting, they become highly attractive to parasitoids. But not only egg parasitoid, as you would anticipate, you have an egg on the plant, the plant reacts with calling for natural enemies, calling for natural enemies of the developmental stage of the pest that is actually, it, 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 the plant is experiencing. However, the plant apparently is much smarter. The plant potentially anticipates a time lag, a delay of the egg parasitoid to arrive. Because if it would only call an egg parasitoid, and the egg parasitoid is not in time, the egg has hatched, and there is a, a larva of a stem borer on the plant. The egg parasitoid is totally useless. So the plant is smart enough to actually also call for a larval parasitoid. In parenthesis, on Monday morning, I, I learned from Tony James the concept of the ugly baby slide. Uh, ugly baby in the sense of 
who likes the ugly baby? Only mom and dad. So uh, word of caution, there are a couple of ugly baby slides coming now and I apologize for this. That's not an ugly baby slide, the next one. We work here on brachiaria. Now, these smart traits are interesting in fodder grasses, but evidently the existence of these smart traits in food crops would be far more valuable for agriculture and it would be far more interesting to see whether these herbivore, uh, de de these defense mechanisms against herbivore also exist in, in cereals. Now what we did in, in a number of experiments is we looked at, we compared land races, ancient land races from Latin America with commercially available hybrid maize in Africa. And this is one of the ugly slides, I'm sorry for this. What we saw is that both egg parasitoids as well as larval parasitoids significantly preferred volatiles from exposed plant, meaning plants that harbored stemora eggs in the land traces, as you can see here and here, but not in the hybrid maze. So the land races apparently still had this ability to communicate with natural enemies, but not the hybrid maze. This was also true for live plants. Live plants were equally attractive in the case of land races, when they were attractive for Cutesia, the larval parasitoid, when they harbored stem eggs, but not the hybrid maize. We found that this effect is not localized, but that this effect is systemic, which means that it, it's going to have a lot more impact in a field situation. And unlike in Braharia, this was not the result of a reduction in one of these uh, HIPV volatiles, but in an increased, oopla, sorry, in an increased emission, which we observed in the land races, but not in the hybrid ones, as you can see here. Very recently, we extended this work and looked into some of the very popular open pollinator maize varieties uh, that farmers prefer in many parts of Africa. And we found more or less the same. These open pollinator varieties have these smart traits, which evidently, or according to our observations, hybrid maize no longer has. And this might be one of the explanations why very often in Africa small-scale farmers are highly reluctant to adopt new and so-called improved varieties vis-a-vis -vis proven existing farmers' varieties. Let me summarize this. Plants inherent, have inherent abilities to modify defenses in a variety of ways. We've seen in Brahraria, the response was uh, to a, um, a chylo oviposition was the suppression of the emission of one of the key volatiles. Whereas in land traces, in maize land traces, and in OPVs, it was an increased emission of certain volatiles. Parasitoids are highly attracted as a result to this blend. And strikingly, this oviposition induced uh, release of parasitoid attractive volatiles is not present in commercial hybrids, which probably indicates that these traits, these genetic traits, somehow inadvertently got lost 
in a breeding, in breeding programs. Now, this evidently opens up the possibility to bring these traits back into such varieties. And we believe that, well, that breeding programs should consider reintroducing these plant defense mechanisms into germplasm and breed for varieties that are clearly more suitable for a sustainable, a more sustainable way of agriculture. A Glucina species. Some a Glucina species transmit pathogens called trypanosomes. Trypanosomes affect livestock. The disease is very often referred to as Nagana and cause the dreaded human sleeping sickness or human African trypanosomiasis in humans, one of the so-called neglected tropical diseases. Some anthropologists believe that nothing has shaped the colonization of the African continent more than setse flies and malaria transmitting anopheline mosquitoes. Some parts of Ethiopia, for example, you see what is often referred to as green deserts. These are river valleys that are lush and green and completely void of human population. You go three, four, four hundred meters in altitude and you reach highland areas that have population densities like in Belgium or in the Netherlands, but with subsistence agriculture. Reason is that these river valleys are heavily infested by setse flies and cannot be colonized. Nagana, the livestock disease that is transmitted by setse flies, is one of the, the biggest economic constraints for agriculture in Africa. It's widespread, it causes tremendous losses, usually estimated to the tune of six and a half billion dollars a year in direct losses to the livestock industry, but equally important, massive losses to agriculture itself, because it's not only that you, you lose meat and milk, but you also lose traction power. So you lose the ability to work your field if your, if your ox succumbs to the Ghana. Human sleeping sickness is, as I said before, one of these so-called neglected tropical diseases. It's widespread in Africa. There's very little that you can do in terms of pharmacological answers. The drugs to treat human sleeping sickness are very old, relatively ineffective, and have, in some cases, horrible side effects, including mortality of patients. WHO estimates half a million cases a year in Africa, which according to me and many others is a very, very, very conservative estimate. The problem with human African trypanosomiasis is that the, the, the symptoms of the disease, the, the initial symptoms of the disease, which are feverish outbursts, are identical to malaria. So in many cases, patients are actually treated with anti-malaria drugs which have no effect whatsoever. So in the absence of any suitable and effective drug, vector control is one of the most important and effective ways to deal with this disease. Let me come back to Nagana. What you see here is the Ngu trap. Ngu von Gurman. Gurman is one of our field stations in the Maasai heartland of uh, southeastern, southwestern Kenya. It's a very simple trap which is based on two principles. First of all, you have this black and blue color. The combination of black and blue is highly attractive on a long range for setse flies. Scientists believe that the black and blue combination resembles the silhouette of an animal. So you have long range visual attraction. With a little bit of imagination, you will see that this is actually a funnel here. And inside the funnel is a little plastic bottle that is filled with some, wool, some acetone and some cow urine. 
The combination of acetone and cowurine is a very strong olfactoric attractant to sensitize short range. So you have dual attraction, long range, visual attraction, short range, olfactoric attraction. The sensitive flies fly into the funnel, phototaxis, positive phototaxis. They try to escape, end up in the top of the trap in this little plastic bag where they are trapped and eventually killed by the heat of the sun. Very simple device, $10 a piece. Most expensive part is the, the cloth material because it has to be UV resistant. Rule of thumb, you need four of these traps per square kilometer. It takes you approximately a year and a half to two and you spatially eradicate setse flies, the savanna species that transmit Nagana, that are among the most important vectors of Nagana. That's the good part of the story. The bad part of the story is you stop, they come back. And including us, many scientists have learned this over and over again. Meaning the solution for this technology, for this control technology is it has to be community based. Communities have to own and manage this technology. Having said so, this is not a suitable, the trapping technology is not a suitable technology for all livestock producers. Now, especially in East Africa, pastoralism is very prevalent. And these pastoralists, they migrate with their herds through the savannas of Eastern Africa. Now, evidently, if you, if you migrate with your livestock, a trapping technology is completely useless. Hence, we went back to the drawing board and thought about an alternative. And an alternative that would be based on just the opposite, not attraction, but repellence. We worked along two strategies, synthetic repellent and a natural repellent. A natural repellent derived from so-called unpreferred host. And in the following, I will concentrate primarily on the work we're doing on the natural plants. For the ones that have done a safari, they will know this animal. That's a waterbuck. Waterbuck is a very common antelope in East Africa. And for the ones that have done a safari and have potentially even come close to a waterbuck, they might remember that they smell pretty strong. Actually, more than that, they stink horribly. Lions leave them alone because they smell so much. Now, not only lions leave them alone, also sensei flies leave them alone. So these water bugs are refractory to sensei flies and actually also tablets. They're not the only ones in the sensei habitat as potential hosts that are refractory. Zebras is the same. And as a matter of fact, we started this work with zebras. But zebras are that wild we soon gave up and concentrated on the more docile water bugs. Cut a long story short, we managed to identify the chemicals that are behind this repellency, this refractoriness in water bugs. Identified five components in a so-called water bug repellent blend. Tested these components on cows in various experiments, including experiments where we had these electrical grids and we measured the, the rate of catch we would have when cows were protected with this water bug repellent blend, as well as the feeding efficiency. And as you can see, applying these water bug repellent blend on cows significantly suppressed the impact on sets of setse on these cows. In the next step, we developed first relatively crude dispensers that we wrapped around the neck of a cow. And you have to imagine that these dispensers constantly release this, this blend. And the cow is, if you want, walking in a cloud of water, but mimicking, or factorically speaking, mimicking a water bug and becoming thus protected against the attack of sensor. Now, 
The first generation of dispensers, not very good. Second, more recent uh, generation of dispensers, much better. Still, there's a lot of imperfection here, and we are, we are trying to team up with, especially the private sector, that has a lot more experiences in developing uh, more appropriate release technologies. What I want to show you in the next couple of slides is, if you want something in the making, about a year ago, we started a massive proof of concept field trial in the southwestern part of Kenya, where we tried to compare, under real field situations, various sensor control technologies, including the water bug repellent dispensers, the traps, insecticide treated targets, as well as insecticides applied as porons directly on the cow. This is the area where these experiments are carried out, and they are next to um, an important national reserve uh, in Kenya. Keep in mind, these national reserves, these national parks, are among the most important refuge areas for setse. So very often you have um, reinvasion of setse flies originating in these national parks. These are the treatments, but more importantly, before we started this experiment, all animals were treated with a trypanocyte to bring the infection at the start, at the onset of the uh, experiment, the, the Ghana infection, down to zero. However, mind you, this is a curative treatment with no lasting protection against reinfection. Just to illustrate you the scale of this experiment, this involves more than 1,500 cattle and 260 pastoralists. Uh, logistically speaking, among the biggest experiments we've ever conducted in the history of Isidio. As I said, this is an experiment that's supposed to last 16, 18, maybe 24 months, and we are 12 months down the road. So this is all really in the making. What I can show you here, first of all, is that the original treatment, the trypanocyte treatment. So we treated all 1,600, 1,500 cattle and brought down the disease incidence to zero. If you particularly concentrate on the, now I lost my pointer, on the push, the water bug repellent curve, you can see that the disease incident consistently remains at a very low level of 10%, whereas in the control, whereas in the control, it's much higher and fluctuates between 30, 20 and 30%. In terms of disease reduction, the water bug repellent blend is generating consistently disease reduction of about 90%, whereas the, the chemotherapy, the trypanocytes alone, range usually hover around 50%. These are results of the cell volume test, that's a, a rapid standard blood test that indicates, if you want, the healthiness of the animals. And again, you can see here the purple curve, the water bug repellent blend performing consistently and significantly better than any other treatment. And if you want, most importantly, this translates into significantly higher body weight. The animals in the water bug repellent treatments in both the push and the push-pull treatment are significantly higher. And this significantly higher body weight translates into money. These animals generate higher, much higher income for the pastoralists in this experiment. If we look at the impact so far, as I said, this is a process in the making. We've seen the weights of the animals that has significantly increased. 
we see that these protected bulls plow two to three times more land. 60% of the farmers have more animal traction. Animals are sold two to three times the price than prior to the start of the experiment. Mere milk yield doubled, despite the fact that these lactating cows are native. And many farmers, and this is actually the biggest problem we are facing now, many farmers demand to be part of this trial, and we have difficulties convincing, monetarily convincing farmers to remain in the control So again, another example where fundamental research on the ecology, especially the chemical ecology of an insect, eventually leads to a practical tool that helps farmers, that helps pastoralists to deal with one of the most pertinent problems they, have, they are facing, in this case, sensitive flies and the garden. Then we come to the last we work a lot on mosquitoes at the Sipe, and traditionally we worked on primarily on malaria. Don't need to explain you how important malaria is, you've heard this throughout the conference. Our focus in malaria has been on vector control, particularly larval vector control, and we are very interested in, in addressing this increasingly important link between human health and agriculture, especially the impact of irrigation on vector-borne diseases. However, today I want to tell you something else. I want to tell you something about mosquitoes and so-called emerging infectious diseases. Jones and Al wrote a, um, a review paper in Nature in 2008 and among others, they coined the term hotbeds. Hotbeds are areas where there's a, a, a much higher likelihood of an outbreak of an emerging infectious disease. And these hotbeds are present throughout the tropics. The Horn of Africa is one of the most important hotbeds for these emerging infectious and very often viral diseases. Now, Jones and Al also observed that there is an inverse relationship between the likelihood of an outbreak of an emerging infectious disease and the capacity to do research on it. To put it very simple, the likelihood that you will find a perfectly equipped laboratory to work on emerging infectious diseases at the University of Wageningen, or in Helsinki, or in Boston, is infinitely higher than one in Mogadishu, or in Southern Sudan, or also in Kenya. So, as a matter of fact, in the areas where these diseases originate from, there's hardly any capacity, there's hardly any knowledge on these emerging infectious diseases. Knowledge in the broadest sense, knowledge on vector taxonomy, the biology and ecology of these diseases. I want to give you three examples of recent emerging infectious diseases. The ones that have followed the press during the last couple of days will have heard about the recent outbreak, very recent outbreak, of West Nile in the greater Dallas region. Texas. Now, West Nile, Normanist woman, comes from the Western Nile region, among others, in Uganda. Now, prior to the, the landing, if you want, the landing of West Nile in Queens, New York, in 1999, hardly anything was known about this disease. And if you look at this massive and rapid spread of West Nile in Northern America, the main reason for this is that biologists found out after the landing of West Nile in North America that birds actually do host also the virus and that the virus is spreading through birds. A fundamental aspect of the ecology of this disease unknown before. Chikungunya, 
Chikungunya is another of these arboviral diseases, very similar to dengue, symptoms very similar to dengue, except that the, the incidence of hemorrhagic fever is considerably lower in chikungunya. Now, chikungunya means in the Makonda language of southern Tanzania, northern, northern Mozambique, that which bends. So in the sense, it's like very often dengue is referred to as the bone breaker fever, that which bends. Up to 2003-2004, chikungunya was like West Nile prior to its arrival in North America, a very obscure, hardly ever worked on disease. In 2005, the disease showed up for the first time outside the African continent on the Comore Islands, to be followed about seven months later with an outbreak on the island of Réunion, also in the Indian Ocean. Now, Réunion is a little bit of a special case because Réunion is one of these so-called Département Outre-mer, Overseas Department of France, meaning French territory, meaning European Union, meaning Euro currency. The outbreak of chikungunya in Réunion left 60% of the population of the island sick for three months. The economic fallout of the chikungunya epidemic on Réunion was quantified to the tune of 1.4 billion euro for the economy of the island. A couple of months later, the disease showed up for the first time on the Indian subcontinent, Kerala state, and from there spread in East Africa. And in 2007, chikungunya was recorded for the first time in the greater Ravenna region of northern Italy. This illustrates that an obscure disease, mosquito transmitted from Eastern and Southern Africa within a handful of years makes a trip not across the globe, but across a significant part of the globe. Last example, and that's what we are working on presently, is Rift Valley fever. It's another, in this case, flood water mosquito transmitted flebovirus disease. And interestingly, Rift Valley fever affects both humans and livestock. And if you want the ironic part of it is, for livestock, there is a vaccine which is considered to be too imperfect for humans. So in these regularly occurring outbreaks of Rift Valley fever, there have been repeatedly cases where the herd was protected through the vaccine, but the herdsmen died of the infection. Now in addition to the loss, the human losses, and to give you a figure, the last Rift Valley fever outbreak in East Africa was in 2008, and approximately 350 to 400 people died during this outbreak. So in addition to, to the, the, the loss of human life and livestock, it's an enormously important, economically speaking, disease for the livestock industry of Eastern Africa because as soon as there is a known case of Rift Valley fever, the main export market for livestock for East Africa, which is the Arabian Peninsula, shuts down, which has tremendous consequences for the livestock industry in East Africa. Now, excuse me for this rather graphic photo. The two most important aspects when it comes to these diseases are monitoring and detection. At the same time, these two aspects, monitoring and detection, are the weakest points. Let me start with monitoring. There are various ways to monitor these emerging infectious diseases. And some of you might have heard of the work of of Nathan Wolf, who has set up this very elaborate network of hunters in, in Central Africa that are sampling uh, wild bushmeat samples that then are analyzed with very refined molecular tools for the presence of novel diseases. Now, this is a very smart way, but it's a hugely costly 
and logistically speaking, enormously demanding setup to, to monitor these diseases. Same thing is true for sentinel hearts. Keeping sentinel hearts in these hotspot areas, and this is something that we've done over the last couple of years, prohibitively costly and logistically speaking, very demanding. So question is, why not use mosquitoes? These diseases, these viral diseases are mosquito transmitted. And especially because nowadays our, our detection tools, especially molecular detection tools, have become so sensitive. Why not sample mosquitoes? Now, the problem is, is that our mosquito sampling techniques and tools are very imperfect presently. Very. The most common tools still are CDC CO2 baited life traps. And the problem is, is that you have all kinds of additional trap catches here. And it's, fun, it's extremely laborious to sift through this material to end up eventually with the mosquitoes. Especially during these inter-epidemic periods where vector density is infinitely low. So what we've done in these two areas uh, of Kenya, uh, which are known to be hotspot areas for Rift Valley fever, we started to spike these traps with chemicals, other chemicals, that were derived from hosts of Rift Valley fever transmitting mosquitoes. We started off with crude extracts from various host organisms like cow, donkey, goat, human. Subsequently, identified the specific compounds in the skin animal and formulated them appropriately. And as you can see, especially this aldehyde blend resulted in 70% increased trap catches of these spiked mosquito traps. I want to skip this slide and move over to another weak part of it, and that's CO2. CO2 as a standard element of this, this, these traps is, especially when you trap in remote areas, incredibly difficult to administer. Now, a year ago, we published a paper with Anand Ray's group from UC Riverside, and we could show that tubutanol activates the same receptor as CO2, which opens up the possibility to replace CO2 with tubutanol, which would make it logistically and economically much more feasible to use this in regular sampling especially in remote areas. Detection used to be a great obstacle with the increasing availability and affordability of, of highly sensitive molecular technologies. This has become of a lesser issue. What we have established at the CIPL is a battery of different Tiers, tier detection tiers. We start, sorry. We start with multiplex mass tech PCR, which enables us to to analyze samples on a family level, followed by high resolution mounting analysis, which breaks it down to known viral diseases. And in case of unknown viral diseases, next generation sequencing will provide us with the answer. Just an illustration of how these high resolution melting analysis can provide you with a very quick and affordable analysis of various uh, important arboviral diseases in East Africa and beyond. Let me come to the conclusion. Isimir was founded by Thomas Udyambo. Um, you know, Thomas Udyambo uh, wrote a very important opinion piece in, 
in, in science in 1967. And let me cite Africa's best long term solution to the problems of conducting effective research is to concentrate research efforts in a very few large centers. One can see such large centers of excellence reverberating throughout the countries where they have been tried. Now, what Thomas and Jambo said 50 years ago is still true today. And our brand new Martin Lucia Emerging Infectious Diseases Laboratory at the CIPA, where most of the work on these abovirial diseases that I've presented to you uh, is being carried out, is an example for such, for such a center of excellence. Let me come at the end to just a handful of little conclusions. Participation of stakeholders. Stakeholders across the board crucial for the success of any such in, um, technology development. Symmetrical cooperation between partners in the North and partners in Africa is paramount. If you want to work at the same level as your partners from Rothamsted, you see Riverside and you name it, you as the partner in Africa, you have to invest. You have to be at the same technical level, you have to be at the same intellectual level. Ecological understanding is key to tackle most of these problems, including diseases. And this requires interdisciplinary research, including social science research. A lot of colleagues at ICIPE have contributed to this work. A lot of partners have been closely involved and we are lucky to have very strong partners across the globe. And we are lucky to have solid and reliable funding organizations that have been with ICIPA for the last four decades and we hope they will stay with us. Thank you very much and visit our booth in the exception hall. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Well, you see, due to the practice rain, we can't have